Not all our family members were pillars of the community, but having a criminal record doesn't mean they were serious violent criminals. Many ancestors with criminal records committed petty offenses or offenses that would not be a crime now. Our ancestors had problems and hardships just as we do today. You may discover that one of your relatives spent time in jail or prison. This discovery can uncover fascinating stories if you can dig a little deeper and learn more about the facts and circumstances of your ancestor's life. If you found a prison inmate in your family tree, you may wonder how to find prison records and what other types of records they might lead to. Today, I'm going to give you an introduction to the basics of criminal records for genealogy. We have a lot to cover today. I'm going to share with you what kind of information you can find in criminal records, preliminary steps, some techniques you need to know, sources of criminal law, how and where to find the five types of records, a criminal records case study, information about ethics in criminal records, and then where to find more sources of information. As I mentioned earlier, people in the past were imprisoned or were transported halfway around the world to prison colonies for offenses that today would barely warrant a slap on the wrist. Vagrancy was a common charge and being unable to pay your debts could get you locked up. Crimes could include sacrilege, fishing in somebody else's pond, or stealing a shilling. So there's not necessarily a lot of shame associated with having a criminal in your pedigree. Criminal records can be very helpful for genealogical research because they can be more detailed than many other types of genealogy records. Criminal records can include photos, addresses, physical descriptions, parents' names and places of birth, spouses and children, religion, health, education, occupation, details about distinguishing marks such as a tattoo. Um, these details that you get from criminal records can give you new ideas for research that you might not otherwise have found. Another thing to consider is that victims, witnesses, lawyers, and judges could also be named in criminal records and maybe one of them is your ancestor. The first place to start with criminal history research is with family information. Ask family members what they know and what documents or memorabilia they might have. Oral history gives us a fuller, more accurate picture of the past by supplementing the information that you get from documentary records Eyewitnesses to events can provide various viewpoints and perspectives that fill in the gaps in documentary records, sometimes correcting or contradicting the written record. You can ask questions left out of other records and interview people whose stories have been untold or forgotten. Sometimes an interview may serve as the only source of information available about a certain event or person. The same is true of family records. My father's military records from the 1960s were destroyed by fire, but I have letters and other family documents that tell me detailed facts about his military service. The difficult thing about oral history with criminal records is that families often want to hush up information about family members who got in trouble with the law. But oral history and family records are still worth pursuing just in case somebody might be willing to talk. Before you look for criminal records, look at basic genealogy records for the family member who ran afoul of the law. Use records such as census, birth, marriage, death, census, immigration, military, and other records to create a timeline of the ancestor's life that includes the locations of where the ancestor lived during each time period. Understanding the social history of your ancestor's time helps you to understand the criminal justice system he or she was judged by. As I touched on earlier, most offenders appearing in the criminal justice system in the past did so for petty crimes. These petty crimes included minor public disorder, drunkenness, assault, and petty thefts. As a result, the imprints of these offenses on the historical records of the past can be small. More evidence exists of more serious offenders and offenses, though this also varies across the country. But our current perceptions of crime should be evaluated against a system that viewed property offenses as being far more significant than our current justice system with its emphasis on interpersonal violence. So even the more serious sentences given by 19th century courts could be the result of a conviction for property offenses. 
In the 18th and the majority of the 19th century, most criminal justice was local. Policing and the court system were organized by local authorities such as city or county officials, and most of the criminal records you'll find come from the local level. Often you'll find records in the magistrate's courts. These were also called petty sessions or police courts. Once you've done preliminary research steps, you'll need to know some research techniques to ferret out the criminal databases that you'll need for your research. A technique that I frequently use to search the, is to search the catalogs of Family Search and Ancestry so that I can focus my search query on the best database for that query. If you limit yourself to the basic search, your search query is going to retrieve all types of records instead of just only the criminal records that you're looking for. So in Family Search, you click on the Search tab, then click Catalog. I've surrounded this area with a green box so you can see it. And the gray search box on the left, you're going to put in your search terms. I used criminal as a keyword and limited my results to online by clicking online under where it says availability. I've highlighted my search query fields with a yellow box so you can see them. You can also refine your search by listing a certain place, time period, or category of search records. My search query returned 1,073 results that contained the word criminal. The library gives you free access to Ancestry when you're in the library. But just remember, Ancestry does not allow free remote access. Searching the catalog in Ancestry is very similar to searching the catalog in Family Search. Click on the Search tab, then click on a card catalog at the bottom of the search menu. I've surrounded this in orange so you can see it better. I searched by keyword using the word criminal. I then limited my search by record type, the court, land, wills, and financial record type category, and then I limited it further to court, governmental, and criminal records. I also limited my search to records from the United States. My search query returned 251 databases. If I need to, I can further limit the search by time period and state. After I limited my search to Georgia, I found the Georgia U.S. Central Register of Convicts 1817 through 1976 database. You're going to see this database later on in my example. When you're searching a state archives website, make sure you don't miss anything. You can see an image of the Georgia State Archives website on the slide. I've outlined the main search bar with an orange rectangle. In my experience, the main search bar does not seem to search the entire website for the Georgia State Archives. I did a search on the main search bar for police and arrest records and did not find anything. There are three boxes on the website that I've surrounded with a yellow rectangle. If you click on these, you'll find additional search fields for searching additional collections that don't seem to be searched by the main search bar. I found records when I searched on the finding aids section that I couldn't find when using the main website search field. Anytime you search a website, be persistent. Click on everything you can find to see what is on the website subpages. If the website has a site map or table of contents, use that to see what's buried down in website subpages. You might find just what you're looking for if you dig a little bit deeper. As you research criminal records, you need to understand the types of criminal records. There are three jurisdictional levels where you'll find criminal records in the United States, and there is overlap between the three levels. For example, drug possession might be prosecuted at the local, state, or federal level, or all three. Although prosecution at multiple levels is not that common, there are no constitutional bars to prosecution in both state and federal court for the same criminal act if it violates both state and federal law. At the local level, there are ordinances passed by the city or county commission. The criminal offenses you might see from the local level include offenses like disorderly conduct, littering, open container violations, shoplifting, and the like. The vast majority of crimes involve state prosecutions for violations of state statutes. Most crimes that come to mind, murder, robbery, burglary, arson, theft, rape, those are violations of state statutory law. State legislatures have always used their general police power to regulate 
conduct, in other words, to create the crime by law. And the state court, the state court system has jurisdiction to, to decide those cases. Just as state legislatures make law prohibiting criminal behavior at the state level, Congress defines and penalizes acts that constitute crimes at the federal level. Generally, federal lawmakers can pass laws only where there is some federal or national interest at stake. For example, counterfeiting U.S. currency is solely a federal offense because only the federal government can print money. The types of criminal records we're going to look at today are police and arrest reports, court records, jail or prison records, and execution records. While the newspaper isn't strictly a type of criminal record, I've included newspaper records because they do often give good information about crimes committed and people accused or convicted of crimes. Now let's look at how and where to find the five types of criminal records. Police and arrest reports can be harder to find than the other types of criminal records, but they are worth looking for. They can tell you the date and time the crime occurred, the charge, where the crime was committed, who made the arrest, and the names of any witnesses. Mug shots, birth dates, and addresses might also be in police arrest reports. Although police and arrest reports can be pretty hard to find, with persistence you might get lucky and find some. I did a keyword search in the Family Search catalog using the word arrest as a keyword, and I saw that Family Search does have arrest record databases for various locations. One police and arrest report database I found on Family Search is California Sacramento Police Jail Registers and Records of Arrest, 1867 through 1940. This is an image only collection, which means it's not indexed. You cannot type in a name and have a result pop up. You have to scroll through digitally page by page, just as you would on microfilm. I saw a John H. Wolf with his first name abbreviated to JNO, who was accused of petty larceny of a crib board. He also stole a mucolage cup, which I learned is a cup for sprouting tiny seeds like basil or chia. You can see a picture of a similar cup on the top right side of the screen. Mr. Wolf also stole chairs, a coat, a clock, and a silver cup. The names of the witnesses were listed on the second page to the far right of the screen beyond what you can see. I put a cropped image of the witness names at the bottom right corner of the slide. So this example gives you the, an idea of the types of details that you might find in police and arrest reports. I did a keyword search on the Ancestry Library Edition catalog and saw an arrest record database for Hibbing, Minnesota. Now this one is indexed and searchable. I did another catalog search on Ancestry Library Edition using police as a keyword, and I found a database for the District of Columbia from 1878 through 1896. In this database, I found a record for Jesse Smith. The record tells us Jesse's age, height, and weight, in addition to the crime, the date of the arrest, and the name of the officer, and remarks that he had a scar on his head above the temple. The National Archives keeps records for federal law enforcement agencies, such as the FBI, U.S. Marshals, and others. So searching the National Archives catalog is a good idea. Georgia Archives has arrest records for various locations in Georgia and sometimes surrounding states as well. Court records are a rich source for criminal records. There are four basic types of criminal court records that you'll find, dockets, minutes, orders, and case files. Dockets are also called court calendars. They're lists of cases heard by the court. They usually list the names of the plaintiff and defendant, the date the case was heard, the case file number, and list of all the documents related to the case. They're usually in chronological, not alphabetical order, but they may be indexed if you get lucky. Dockets are like a table of contents for the case files. Minutes are brief daily accounts kept by the clerk of court of all actions taken by the court each day. They usually include the names of the plaintiff and defendant and a brief description of the action taken by the court. 
They're in chronological order and are seldom indexed. Orders are the specific judgments of the court. They usually include a brief description of the case and the judgment to be carried out. Some court actions recorded in court orders cannot be found in any other court records. Case files is where you'll find the most helpful information. A case file consists of a packet or bundle of all the loose documents relating to that case, such as copies of evidence, testimony, bonds, depositions, correspondence, and petitions. Criminal case files can include witness testimonies and details about the person and the crime they were accused of. To find a case file, you're going to need the case file number from the docket, the minutes, or an index. I'm going to show you an example of a case file later on. I did a catalog search by location for Doherty County, Georgia in Family Search. In the court records section for Doherty County, I saw a database, District Court Minutes 1871 through 1882, and this is an image-only collection. The image you see on the slide is, is page 14, is, is image 14 of the 414 images available in that database. This is the case of the state versus John Byrd, who pled not guilty to stabbing. Family Search has a large number of circuit court case files. You can find them by searching the catalog using the words circuit court case files in the keyword field. These are typically image-only collections, so you'll need to do preliminary research to know what you're looking for and a timeline. If you want to see fairly recent court records, most counties now have online case management systems. Here's an example from Doherty County, Georgia. From the Doherty County homepage, click Courts, then Clerk of Court. Then click Case Management. The public password is automatically provided, so you just click log in. You can search court records by party name or case number. The case number search is very finicky, so I usually use party name even if I have a case number. I'm searching for John Smith by way of example, since that's a common name. There are 13 results for the name John Smith, so I click on the first one. I see the state of Georgia versus John Smith, but I still can't tell what John Smith was accused of. At the time of this case, John Salter was the state court judge. State court does not handle serious felonies, so I know this isn't murder or something like that. I want to know more, so I click on Proceedings. I learned that on January 9, 1998, Judge Salter entered his final order convicting Mr. Smith of having no proof of insurance, a petty crime. The local clerk of court has records of cases that predate the electronic case management systems, so start your search for state criminal case records in the county courthouse in the county where the crime was alleged to have been committed. Court clerks are overworked, understaffed, and underpaid. Helping genealogists is not their priority, so you have to ask for help very nicely. This example from Darty County, Georgia, um, you can Google the name of the county and state that you're researching and look for its clerk of court website to see if that location has digitized re records that you can search. If there are no digitized records for your time, time period, um, you'd have to go to the courthouse. The county record search that I showed you is for fairly recent records. For older Georgia cases that, were not, that are not located in the county courthouse, you'll want to research Georgia Archives. Georgia Archives has criminal court records for various counties in Georgia at various time periods. I found these records for Franklin and Wilkes counties by searching the Georgia Archives catalog. If you want to look up cases from the past 15 years in federal court, you'll want to research the Public Access to Court Electronic Records, or PACER, system, which is a service of the federal judiciary. The PACER system was established by the Judicial Conference in 1988 to allow public access to court information without having to travel to local courthouses. PACER gives you instantaneous access to more than 1 billion documents filed at more than 200 federal courts. 
nearly all the documents filed by a judge or the parties in any case. You can register an account and search for documents for free, but there is a fee of 10 cents per page for PDF downloads of documents. The cost to access a single document is capped at 30 pages or $3 for documents and case-specific reports. If the federal court records you need are older than 15 years, you might find them at the National Archives. The National Archives has 14 regional records facilities, and you'll generally find federal district court records at the facility closest to the court. For example, the National Archives at Atlanta holds federal court records from Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. The exception to this general rule is bankruptcy case files. Those are in Kansas City. Most federal courts of appeals records are held at the National Archives at Kansas City, with two exceptions. The Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals records are held at the National Archives at Chicago, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals records are held at the National Archives at San Francisco. U.S. Supreme Court records are held at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. To search the National Archives for court records, you'll search the National Archives catalog. It has a basic search and an advanced search. Once you click search, the search results has fields to the left side that you can use to limit your search results. The National Archives has so many records and types of records that it can be complex to navigate the catalog. You should look at the National Archives help information for, um, so that you can learn how to use the catalog. Now let's look at jail or prison records. If your ancestor was convicted of a crime, you might find jail or prison records about your ancestor. Some prison and jail records still exist, but there's no central place where they're kept. Many will be paper or microfilm records in archives and other institutions, but fortunately some are now online. Jails and prisons are different. Jails were temporary holding places designed to hold people who were awaiting trial. Jails are run by local authorities. Prisons, on the other hand, are designed to hold people who've been convicted of crimes. State prisons hold people who were convicted of state crimes and they're run by state level authorities. Federal prisons hold people who were convicted of federal crimes and they've been run by federal authorities since our federal prison system began in 1891. The image on the slide is a page from the Georgia U.S. Central Register of Convicts, 1817 through 1976. It gives the age, height, complexion, skin color, eye color, home county, occupation, place of origin, and the crime they were convicted for. Three more columns extend on the next page. The second page of the record tells the date when the person was received by the prison and the date they were rele released, as well as any remarks by the prison staff. Famous prisons such as Alcatraz have their own archives. If you want to find a recent prison record for Georgia, you can look up someone on the Department of Corrections website. I did a search for the name James Smith because that's a common name that would produce plenty of records. The Department of Corrections website shows you the person's photo, physical description, and incarceration details. If you want to look up recent prison records for federal prisons, you'll go to the Federal Bureau of Prisons website. Only inmates released after 1982 can be found on this website. You'll put your cursor over inmates, then click find an inmate. You can do a search by inmate name. I searched by James Smith again, since that's a common name. My search brought up a list of James Smiths that I can look through and then select one for more information. The Federal Bureau of Prisons includes information on its website about the history of our federal prison system that may help you understand what federal prisons were like at the time period that you're researching. Execution records are another type of record that you can find. FamilySearch has a number of databases that include executions. Ancestry Library Edition has very little on executions. 
The National Park Service website includes records about the 86 men executed at Fort Smith from 1873 until 1896. The gallows scaffold was located against the southeast corner of the wall that surrounds the old fort. These men had been convicted of rape or murder, and during this time period, there was a mandatory federal death sentence for convictions of rape or murder. As I said earlier, newspaper records aren't really a criminal record, but they're very handy when you're researching criminal records. The great thing about digitized newspaper websites is that they're word searchable. You can see that the word burglar, burglary is highlighted in pink because I had used that as my keyword in a search. The results returned to me with that highlighted whenever it appeared. Having word searchable historic newspaper collections means you can find obscure references to your ancestor in newspapers and on dates you weren't expecting. When you search historic newspapers online, make one of your searches a name without a location to pick up any references in the newspapers outside of their hometown. Depending on the crime, an article may not be limited just to the local newspaper. The bigger the crime, the more widespread was the newspaper coverage. Georgia has a historic newspaper collection and other states do as well. In addition, the Library of Congress has a collection of digitized historic newspapers called Chronicling America. Here's a case study of finding criminal records. In May of 2021, genealogist Larry W. Thomas, who's from Atlanta, asked me to help him obtain some Doherty County criminal records for Episode 6, Season 8 of Finding Your Roots. We were researching Edward Cruz, grandfather of movie star Terry Cruz. If you have a Georgia Public Broadcasting Passport membership, you can view Finding Your Roots episodes on demand, or you can check out Season 8 on a DVD from your local Georgia Pines library. I looked in the Ancestry Library Edition database called Georgia U.S. Central Register of Convicts 1817 through 1976, which I showed you earlier. The database includes the misdemeanor sentence register. Edward Cruz is number 17 on the list on this page. He was convicted of abandonment in Calhoun County and sentenced to 12 months. On another page in the misdemeanor sentence register, he appears again, this time in Doherty County, and it appears that he was convicted of burglary and or attempted burglary. The second column tells us his file number, which was 76637. I used that number to get his record from the clerk of Doherty County Superior Court. The flood of 1994 destroyed those records for Calhoun County, so I was not able to get his case file for the abandonment conviction. The clerk of Doherty County Superior Court was kind enough to pull Edward Cruz's criminal case file for me. The case file was five pages long. I'm going to show it to you so that you can see what a case file looks like. The first page gives us a list of the witnesses for the state, the name of the jury foreman, the name of the solicitor general, Mastin O'Neill, and the name of the prosecutor, a Mr. Clegg. The second page of Mr. Cruz's case file gives us a list of the grand jurors. Their charge says, says that Mr. Cruz broke into Jim's package store and committed burglary on the 22nd day of December, 1956. The warrant tells us that Mr. Cruz lived at 521 North Davis Street in Albany. Seven witnesses are listed, including police officer Leslie Summerford. Page four of Mr. Cruz's case file tells us that the liquor store he broke into was located at 819 West Broad Street in Albany. It also includes the warrant for Mr. Cruz's arrest. Page five of the case file tells us that Mr. Cruz pled guilty to burglary on March 29, 1957. He was sentenced to 12 months of hard labor on a chain gang. That shows you how different the criminal justice system was back then. You know, here, here's a misdemeanor and he's going to be on a chain gang for 12 months. The presiding judge was Carl E. Crow. Now let's think about the ethical issues that can arise when you find criminal records. 
Sharing information about family criminal records can raise serious ethical issues because family members can be hurt or embarrassed by the distribution of information about black sheep family members. As you consider what information to reveal, ask yourself, is the accused person still alive? Are that person's children still alive? Would publicizing that information cause hurt, embarrassment, or any other type of harm? I have family members who were accused of federal crimes in the late 1980s, and their case was heard by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in 1990. I chose not to use information about that case as an example for this class because one of the accused family members is still living and children of the two, two deceased accused people are still living. It was a terrible situation that caused hurt, embarrassment, and some family estrangements. It's not worth the pain to reveal that information at this point. So please be sensitive to ethical issues as you pursue criminal records in your genealogy research. If you want to know more about researching criminal records or black sheep family members, Cindy's List is a good place to find more information. Cindy's List has a category called Prisons, Prisoners, and Outlaws that will give you ideas to try. Ancestry Library Edition has message boards for surnames as well as for topics. There's a message board for prisons and a message board for crime. You can read questions and answers that were posted by other researchers. You cannot post a question unless you have an individual subscription to Ancestry, but you can read other people's questions and answers. The Family Search Wiki has good information about finding court records, including criminal records. You can click on information about each state to learn more about state resources. This is what the Georgia State page looks like for Georgia court records. BlackSheepAncestors.com has information about criminal records in the US, Canada, and the UK. The National Archives of the UK gives excellent information on tracing criminal ancestors in the UK. In addition to informational websites, your Pines Public Library can help you find books and DVDs on using criminal records for genealogy research. Thank you for joining me as we explored criminal records for genealogy. And don't miss next month's class about researching family history using genealogy periodicals. Until then, happy researching!